Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. If you are a returning listener, subscriber, welcome back. So glad to have you here again. If you are new to the channel, welcome. If you do enjoy what we do here on your way out, please give the show a like. If you really dig it, give it a subscribe. I do want to announce something right on time. You guys were making fun of me saying, oh, this show never starts on time. You know what? Maybe you're right. <laughs> but that's not the point. Your rightness isn't what we're talking about right now. But I was reminded by one C. Derek Varn that he will be joining me and a whole host of others in Washington, D.C. for a TIR live experience beyond Black Jacobin, CLR James, and the struggle for socialism in America. Adolph Reed, Pascal, Daniel Tut, Vanessa Wills, Derek Varn, Billy Bunton. You may know him as Toussaint calls him, Jason Stunt Double. It's fucked up. He's his own man, Toussaint. Don't be so sexist and racist. You're sexist racist. And me, Jason Miles. This will be June 8th at Bus Boys and Poets. And there's going to be some kind of after party. <gasps> Where I don't know yet. It has not been announced. But this show has been announced. Tickets should be on sale. I'll have a link up in the chat for that. Maybe. Because it's just me here. And I have, maybe. Don't hold me to that. Daniel Tut, if you're watching, <laughs> put a link in the chat. I have failed. But I'll be back tomorrow with the Red Zone. And I'll definitely have links up in every description moving forward for, for all these shows to this. Because this event, unlike the usual events we do, because I am a big proponent of you need to be there going to be live streamed so there's that you can if you if you can't make it to dc you know you can always watch the live stream so again june 8th bus boys and poets tir live with adolf reed that sounds like a good time to me so and daniel tut Daniel Tut's been on the show a few times. Every time Tut comes on the show, it's always a good time. I know on Twitter, we did, we weren't even beefing. We were just having a discussion about him wanting to engage with MAGA communism's Haas and me saying, oh, that kind of seems like a great big waste of time. Give a damn what that guy has to say about anything. But you know what I do care about? Journalism. And our guest today wrote a book with his over a decade of experience talking or er, uh, covering WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. So let's get into that. The name Julian Assange and the term whistleblower are synonymous. We the people believe in a freedom of information. We believe that our government and large corporations should not be sheltered by the media, but the media should be able to expose their misdeeds to the public. Excuse me. There should be no clandestine deep state to protect public servants when it is the people that their tyranny is afflicted upon. Julian Assange and his WikiLeaks website has been a thorn in the side of imperial power since it started on October 4th, 2006 in Iceland. Since its inception, WikiLeaks has claimed to have released over 10 million documents to the public that have, that have exposed most uh, the most notable documents released in 2010 are of the military attacks in 2007 in Baghdad, where a U.S. helicopter killed 12 to 18 people, including civilians and two Reuters reporters. Today, we have journalist Kevin Gostola, who has spent the last 10 years covering whistleblowers, WikiLeaks, and Assange. Wherever you are watching or listening, there is links in the description to the book, Guilty of Journalism, with a foreword by Abby Martin. From the book, Guilty of Journalism, 
Carrie Shankman, an expert on the Espionage Act, was an associate of Michael Ratner, who was an esteemed human rights attorney and part of the WikiLeaks legal team until he died of cancer in 2016. For Assange's extradition trial in the September 2020, the defense turned to Shankman to help educate District Judge Vanessa Brassider on the law and its history. According to Shankman, the Espionage Act was a product of one of the most repressive periods in the history of the United States. President Woodrow Wilson introduced legislation to prosecute spies after the United States entered World War I. But as Shankman said, the conduct the law could be used to criminalize went well beyond spying. Wilson went on to call the law a firm hand of stern repression against anyone who dissented against U.S. involvement in the war. Immediately, the Espionage Act reflected the government's desire to control information and public opinion regarding the war effort. It embraced broad prescriptions against the possession and transmission of information related to national defense established severe penalties for criticism of the war, contained conspiracy provisions, and established a censorship system for the press. The law's powers were not limited to wartime. Socialist Party presidential candidate Eugene Debs was prosecuted under the law and sentenced to prison for 10 years after he gave a speech in 1918 in Canton, Ohio. The speech was considered the most famous protest speech of its time. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. The master class has had all to gain and nothing to lose, while the subject class has had nothing to gain and all to lose, especially their lives, Debs proclaimed. Debs warned before his sentence, free speech, free assemblage, and free press Three foundations of democracy and self-government are but a mockery under the espionage law administered and constructed by the official representatives of the ruling class. Again, that is from the book Guilty of Journalism by our guests. Please give a big TIR welcome to Kevin Gostola. Welcome, welcome. Hello. How are you? It's good to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm glad to have you here. Glad to have you here. Um, you know, uh, I was a little worried at first. I was like, oh no, but you, you made it. We're all good. We're all here. We're ready to talk about an uncomfortable topic, you know, Julian Assange it, and his, and his it, current situation and what led him there. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? into journalism and covering whistleblowers. Uh, were you a hall monitor in school? <laughs> oh, I was not someone like that who <laughs> went around complaining about people who did not follow the rules. No, just, I just kidding. But you're, you're, you do discuss your journey here in the book. Um, but tell us a little bit about uh, how you found out that what you wanted to do is, is cover whistleblowers and kind of expose the truth. Yeah, it became a natural part of the progression mm -hmm. or, or the or the sort of path that I was on. Uh, when I went to college, my thought was I would like to be a filmmaker. I've always been a fan of uh, cinema and I still am. Uh, but while I was going to school in Chicago, I engaged with a bunch of different groups on the ground, grassroots organizations that were mobilizing against the Iraq war and also were protesting torture, CIA torture, U.S. military torture and uh, challenging Bush and Cheney. And so those were formidable time for me uh, in, in shaping my worldview. And uh, I was writing, I was on the internet when it was easy to be a disruptor when it was possible to, you know, it, it's not like it is today. Back <laughs> then, it was really easy to cultivate a following, and uh, I did that. And 
when I found it was going to be extraordinarily difficult to, you know, just jump into the industry and get a job, I decided to take my following that I had from doing some writing about activism, uh, cover uh, writing about politics, writing about civil liberties. Uh, wasn't terribly ideological. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I suppose I was introduced to socialism a little bit later after I made my foray into uh, journalism. Uh, I am sympathetic to socialist ideas. Uh, I'll throw that out there since it fits your show. But uh, I saw these documents published and immediately recognized that there were scoops in the documents that were worth covering. And they provided me with stories, uh, the way that newspapers were finding stories around the world, uh, particularly in these U.S. embassy cables that were coming out. We were learning so much information about way the way the United States engages in foreign policy. Mm -hmm. and some of it, people maybe could guess that that's what the U.S. did behind closed doors. But here was confirmation on the pages. And from that point... It just made sense that if I was benefiting from these documents, I needed to care about the source. I needed to care about who took the risk to release this information and who was now being tortured and abused by the U.S. military. And that was Chelsea Manning. U.S. Mm -hmm. Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning was first taken to Kuwait, uh, went through some horrific treatment, then was put on a plane and brought to Quantico Marine Base uh, there. Uh, she was put in isolation and went through abuse there and then um, eventually was brought to Leavenworth Military Prison and waited, waited for a trial. Um, I, I followed this entire proceeding very closely going to Fort Meade in Maryland to report on her. At around that time, there's a lot happening with whistleblowing. Barack Obama became associated with this war on whistleblowers and this unprecedented use of the Espionage Act. I got to meet Daniel Ellsberg, uh, Pentagon Papers whistleblower, godfather of whistleblowers, who uh, unfortunately left us last year. Um, uh, but uh, he was kind of mentor for all these people who are willing to take risks and come forward. And I got to be exposed to all these stories. But I would say my entry into journalism, my entry into doing this work was just this recognition that these people who are willing to take risks for us, mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to ignore what they were doing and just simply, like the New York Times or the Washington Post journalists do, go about my business pretending like they don't exist. W would you say you were radicalized a little bit about by the Iraq war? Oh, definitely. Definitely. That started kind of for you? Observation. But it also comes from you know, honestly, the way that I consumed uh, films, you know, like like documentaries opening my eyes to different stories, you know, being able to watch. I mean, I I can just off the top of my head can recall several war documentaries, um, not necessarily anti not necessarily anti-war documentaries, but also I can recall um, a, a documentary about the the coup that we tried to engineer against Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and 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 you know, becoming turned on to that kind of yeah. uh, issue, uh, that, that kind of activity and, and, and recognizing very early, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm very proud to say that I never fell for Barack Obama. I'm very proud to say that even though it was very common for people of my generation to believe that he was going to be this hope and change that, um, I could see very early that there was a lot packaged there that was just about advertising and getting people to believe something that he was going to never deliver. And from the day one of his presidency, uh, you know, part of why it was really easy for me to engage with WikiLeaks and uh, cover this with credibility was because I wasn't afraid that writing about this or giving it attention was going to hurt Barack Obama. I mean, there's so many <laughs> journalists out there that somehow think it's their role to make sure that they don't hurt somebody. So, you know, you may hear this year that a, 
oh, we have to be careful. It could hurt Joe Biden and make it yeah. easier for Donald Trump to get elected. It's the way this uh, file system tends to work. And so I, uh, I never subscribed to that idea. Uh, you know, we're doing this live thing in DC and, and one of the people that exposed Barack Obama uh, kind of predicted it. Maybe 95, 96 was Adolf Reed. Um, he writes about it in class notes. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. Yeah, I, I actually am felt familiar with Adolf Reed. Um, and uh, I, I uh, in in becoming engaged with different people, there, you know, there there were there was someone. Um, I should be. His name was Paul Street. I don't think he's really <laughs> around anymore. But uh, I haven't seen work from him very recently. But um, I know that he was a big fan of Adolf Reed's. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, he kind of called out. You know, who Obama was was going to be many many years ago, um, but now kind of switching gears back to Julian Assange. Can you tell us a bit about how Assange starts WikiLeaks and what is his goal with this WikiLeaks project? Yeah, and I, I would say for Julian Assange, uh, if you're part of the left, um, you, you do have to acknowledge that he's a complicated figure um, and that. You know, in the past, uh, it it's a combination of of I think being skeptical of war and being skeptical of the kind of meddling that um, happens by governments, being interested in exposing corruption with governments. But there's definitely much like with Edward Snowden, there's a libertarian strain. I was just about that, to ask you that that, 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 that <laughs> runs. That runs throughout of it, um, yeah. and, you know, and it's the, uh, let's just say, I have no doubt that if Julian Assange hadn't gone, been going through what he's been going through for the last seven years, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I mean this not in a way that is intended to degrade or pile on Julian Assange, who, who I, I really have no intent to add to the smears that are out there, but let's just be fair, he probably would be telling us about a kind of crypto uh, currency out there, a kind of altcoin that we could buy that would help us change the world. That that's the kind of thing. Um, you know, he he is from a group of people that did believe that uh, technology could just through its natural application liberate us from a lot of the injustices. And and there was a kind of rosy period, especially in 2010, 2011, where not only was that sold to us by like the U S state department, as we saw these uprisings in middle East and Northern Africa, but it was also, you know, it was believed that by a lot of people um, across the political spectrum, that these uh, technologies were going to just by virtue of them being new and available to us, whether we're talking about Twitter, Facebook, whatever, that these platforms were going to be the, an easy path to, uh, curing a lot of injustice and uh, boy, was that proven wrong, but, um, <laughs> but you know, his idea is a very innovative one. And I, I think it is to his credit that he went out there and put together this leak site with a small group of individuals that had an admirable goal of, uh, of seeking out information from human rights activists, whistleblowers around the world. You know, his first publications are coming from, primarily within the African continent. Uh, I mean, he was associated with Kenya and exposing some corruption within that country very early on. And then uh, it's only because Chelsea Manning wasn't able to convince anyone at the New York Times or the Washington Post or other publications to take her seriously that, you know, she just went online to the submission system and sent 750,000 plus documents to WikiLeaks. And then now all of a sudden, WikiLeaks is hugely relevant in a way because it has this material about the Iraq war, the mm -hmm. Afghanistan war, mm -hmm. and uh, all the different prisoners that are being held at Guantanamo indefinitely, uh, who, you know, uh, less than 3% of them could be said to have done anything related to um, terrorism that killed you know hundreds of civilians so you know the vast majority of those people have been set free and were never put on trial and then we had these 250,000 diplomatic cables and along with in the intro to your show you mentioned the collateral 
murder video. And the idea was this concept of scientific journalism. And again, I don't want to sit here and claim that there's some kind of scholarship behind this idea, but it was just the phrase that Julian Assange or people associated with WikiLeaks would use, which is to say that rather than have newspapers publish investigative pieces that were based on classified documents or other primary source information and not allow readers to see that information, WikiLeaks was going to be a database that made all of the documents that they obtained publicly available. So you could use it. You didn't have to be working for any of these publications. You didn't, you know, uh, it was a democratization of information, essentially. It was, and it was, I think, a way of liberating information. These were secrets. These were things that governments around the world did not want people to read, theoretically. And WikiLeaks was going to make that information accessible to uh, millions of people by virtue of posting it on the internet. Um, is the democratization of information a good thing? Yeah, although I think we would have to peel back what exactly it means to democratize information. I, you know, in my view, I would start from the standpoint that we have a national security state that classifies way too much information mm -hmm. um, and begin from that standpoint. Of course, there are different types of information that you and me will never get to read um, aside from the information that is in the hands of security or intelligence agencies or the military. And they say, we can't read it. There are what get treated as like trade secrets, but they aren't really there. Are, there's economic or corporate documents that are in the hands of private executives. Uh, and they conceal their actions as they are, you know, engaged in, uh, is what we'll call, for lack of a better phrase, rapacious capitalism in the sense that they do not, you know, all they care about is extraction and maximizing profits. And we're not going to be able to read mm -hmm. what their intentions or aims are. And like, for example, like Exxon Mobil now, it's very well known that like 50 years ago, they knew the way that the climate was going to be destroyed through their actions, but they kept that secret as long as possible so people didn't know that they were aware of their impact on the planet. And so you have this overclassification of information and uh, democratization is a crude way of putting it because there are going to be players who are trying to release different sets of documents for their own personal agendas. And we may not necessarily support those personal agendas, but by and large as a journalist, I do uh, have to say that my responsibility is to whether the documents that are released are authentic and have truth within them and the motivations for why those documents are disclosed are not irrelevant, but they should not mean that I don't show an interest in what has been exposed. So if I believe that certain information is in the public interest and should not be kept secret, then I think it is a benefit to democracy and justice that we have access to those documents. It, it is interesting because I was, I was thinking this as I was reading your book and I thought about, was it last year or early this year? I can't remember where there was a guy on the internet that had worked for the military that was like, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if, and, and one of the conversations we had on this show was that so much gets classified that doesn't really need to get classified that this idea of leaking, I mean, 700,000 documents is a lot. I refuse to believe in 700,000. Every single thing you read was of utter importance. I'm sure there was a lot of like, no one needed to know that. Um, there is a, it feels like, and, and you kind of talk about this in the book that there is this over classification. Maybe it's just supreme protection, right? I mean, yeah, 
if I was in power, I definitely wouldn't want my emails getting leaked. Although if I could add something to what you're saying about the 700,000 documents, that's your, your, uh, so the reason why you publish the whole set is because government officials lie. And what will happen if you don't post the entire set of documents, assuming that you have been given all of what can be called a set mm -hmm. is because someone is going to come out there and say that, uh, oh, well, that's what these documents show, but they didn't publish these files that actually do show we care about civilians and we aren't just systematically targeting them with airstrikes or, uh, you know, they're going to try and find a way to weasel around uh, accusations that might be leveled against the government based on what has been exposed. And uh, I'm not just making that up. That is the reason why Daniel Ellsberg released all of the study, which was thousands upon thousands of pages. And in that time, he went to the trouble to go Xerox every single page and make uh, several copies that were distributed to dozens of newspapers in the United States. So he could beat Richard Nixon and the administration's efforts to have publication blocked in the media. Of course, he failed. Um, um, you know, what we call probably call the Streisand effect now took hold where it was not possible to fight the news papers anymore because it was already out. And also, you know, he's in court fighting the New York Times. Meanwhile, the St. Louis Post Dispatch is releasing the Pentagon. It's lost now. Yeah. It's it's all yeah. out there for everybody. How do you feel about that? I know this is a bit of a personal question. Um, how do you feel about the fact that information is out there for everybody? Twitter is a news source for mainstream media at this point in 2024 and has been for a little bit. Um, maybe Obama starts it, but Trump definitely makes it his way to de his decrees through Twitter. Um, it, had Joe Biden not been so old and senile, he probably would be doing the same things. Um, it'd be a lot easier for him to tweet than, you know, roll that man out. Um, how do you feel about the fact that there's so much that gets dumped on people at once? And when we think about investigative journalism, for me, the thing that I enjoy about reading good investigative journalism is that someone like, like yourself, for example, this is 10 years of your life in this book. And it's not just Julian Assange. You were, you, of course, you were covering Chelsea Manning and, and WikiLeaks and Assange is, just, is a part of this broader story. But this is 10 years of you digging deep literally going to a trial and are we losing that with kind of the loss of newspapers and even local weeklies that used to have great investigative journalism i toured as a musician for years so i mm -hmm. loved grabbing the local weekly whatever town i was in and finding out what the scuttlebutt was on the city um and that's fading and yeah and i think that's a, a a sad problem that I don't think many Americans acknowledge or care that much about. Um, journalism isn't what it, I don't want to say is what it used to be. It's just, it's a harder field to get into. It's expensive. You, you go to school for it now. Uh -huh. um, um, what's your take on that? Well, so I uh, donate to my local weekly here in Chicago, the Chicago reader, uh, they managed to get out from under some situation Mega where I, some situation where some scum sucking capitalist was trying to ruin it basically. And they tried to make it a kind of not for profit operation. It's always been valuable to me. You know, mm -hmm. it's where I know what movies uh, musicians are having shows, what uh, theater shows are happening, what's the festivals that are coming to town, what kind of events are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention they do very good social interest stories. So the idea that there wouldn't be one newspaper in your town that you could turn to as a resource is something that is being lost. 
Uh, what I hear in your question is a couple things. At, you know, primarily what I think of is when people are afraid of the endless stream of filth and just misinformation and also sometimes it's just people who are vitriolic and um, taking out their rage on uh, vulnerable groups that we have to emphasize media literacy. Uh, so in an age when there's all kinds of information available, in an age when it can be weaponized, uh, in an age when there are groups, uh, not just political elites, but all kinds of different actors that can weaponize that information, the, the challenge is somehow helping people to understand what is being published and how to question that information and understand that information and where it's coming from. Obviously, um, one of the things that I've had to deal with as a journalist is this idea that, you know, hey, you have to be objective or, or neutral as a journalist when you cover this story. Or, uh, and then there's a lot of discussion sometimes about media being biased or not biased. You know, I ran a small media organization for several years. Um, unfortunately, my partner took a different path. It's defunct. But in, in doing that work, you know, I learned how to put out stories and support independent journalists and provide freelance writers a hub for what they were doing. Um, and in my experience, you know, one of the things is that it doesn't really um, matter if you have a point of view in doing that journalism. And in fact, that work is probably better if you have some personal knowledge or you've dug deep. So, you know, when I started this work 10 or 15 years ago, I don't know if it's as popular today, but to have fully formed views about the value of whistleblowing, to have fully formed views that like the government classifies too much information or to have the view that um, war is always a crime or something like that, that would be to your discredit as a journalist. But I just think that for me and my readers, what I would prefer to do and what I think most people should probably find as being more reasonable is to just not hide what you think and to let people engage with you. So I'm willing to be an open book and say that these are the perspectives that I have while I put to out put out accurate information, why while I cover uh, Julian Assange's case, for example, or Chelsea Manning's case, for example, in great detail. And um, I try not to steer people in any direction. Uh, I don't know if this has anything to do with your question, but I'll just <laughs> throw, throw out there that I try not to like steer people in any direction and say, like, here, I expect you to think about this. And if you don't, it's wrong. I think it's better to make all the information available. And then once you know people have been educated, then you know I can contextualize it later. Um, I can place it within an ideal ideology. But I mean, I will say that I have political views that are left wing about many of these but uh, the book is not. The book is non-ideological. And I think that's probably the best way of getting to people because there isn't a lot of consistent reporting on this to begin with. So first and foremost, I needed to make sure that people understood the basics because let's just face it. Many of the whistleblower cases that are part of the progression of how the Espionage Act has been uh, weaponized, and then you know after going after these certain individuals, now the U.S. Justice Department feels confident that they can go after a journalist in an unprecedented case. Um, I need to make sure that people are educated before I talk to them about ideas 
around it. So, I mean, like a follow-up book might be to contextualize this. You know, I've thought about things like whistleblowing against the empire. Um, I've taught, I've thought about how there's this concept, uh, there's this concept that Noam Chomsky has popularized of uh, unworthy and worthy victims. Well, in my head, I, 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 I see unworthy and worthy whistleblowers. I see people who the media tells us we should support because of what they're exposing. And then there are those that they do not want us to support and pretend like they aren't whistleblowers, even though they're doing the exact same thing that other people are doing. And it usually just depends on what they're exposing. So if they're exposing something that everyone can get behind, like how Facebook is, I guess, preying on children or um, allowing foreign governments to influence content, then yes. they're for that. They want that whistleblower to get all the hearings, all the media interviews, all the attention. But if somebody comes out there and is trying to expose war crimes in Iraq by the U.S. military, mm, no, we can't have that. That's just too touchy for us. Hmm. That's interesting uh, that you bring up uh, the Facebook thing, as that seems to be almost bipartisan in uh, in Congress, that everybody wants to put some sort of handle on Facebook. But kind of you know, getting to your point about muddying the waters, which I think media literacy is extremely important. I mean, one of my, I don't want to say life's work, but it's consumed me for the last few years. I'm doing a kind of a video essay documentary project. If you're familiar with Adam Curtis, I don't know if you watch. Mm -hmm. Adam Curtis. So in the kind of that style um, called kayfabe, about political kayfabe, which is pretty much what we're talking about now when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Uh, you explain in your book uh, mainstream or legacy media's role in muddying the waters around Assange and WikiLeaks. Can you tell us uh, what he's actually convicted of or accused of and how an Australian citizen can even be extradited to the U.S. Yeah, so Julian Assange has been accused of 17 violations of the Espionage Act. Uh, and generally speaking, what we're talking about here are standard news gathering activities. Everyone who works for a major media organization, or as I dub them, uh, well, I use Jules Boykoff, a term that Jules popularized. Um, or used for Jules's book about, um, I think it was about dissent. And uh, so um, I just lost my train of thought. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you're talking about what he was, he was convicted of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, he has 17 two, counts of violating sorry. the Espionage Act. And then there's one that's a computer crime offense. He's accused of trying to help Chelsea Manning. Uh, go through uh, military computer an anonymously, or they say it's usually called the password cracking conspiracy. Yeah. Um, I won't complicate your show by trying to go down that route and, and, and dig into the weeds. But what I will say is that this overarching conspiracy that has been made up has no basis in reality. Although that's what the Trump justice department is uh, took off and ran with, and then Joe Biden's Justice Department hasn't done anything to um, change the fact that it has no basis. And, and so what they're trying to say to the public is that uh, WikiLeaks is an organization that's a criminal enterprise that existed to steal information um, mm -hmm. and particularly work with hackers and uh, spies all around the world, uh, especially from governments that oppose the United States, and that uh, they reached out to Chelsea Manning and basically recruited her and asked her to go through the uh, military system and uh, purloin or take these documents for WikiLeaks. Uh, the only problem with that is that it has nothing, it, there, there's nothing from Chelsea Manning's trial that matches that conspiracy theory. In fact, her own statement in court when she pled guilty to some of the charges before her trial, she came out and said that, uh, you know, first off, she if she was put up to it and recruited, she was trying to leak to media before then. So that's not true. And then also, you know, she had access to all this material, so uh, she could give it to WikiLeaks without any help from them. They, she didn't need assistance from 
WikiLeaks. And then also the fact that she had very clear political reasons for all of these. I did, I, I, and I summarize all of those reasons in the book of, you know, see, particularly let's just go to that collateral murder video of like watching it and feeling that it was like war porn and feeling the like bloodlust of these soldiers and, 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 and being repulsed by it, but also recognizing that in the unit in which she was a part, her colleagues or fellow soldiers would like, watch these videos as entertainment while they were on uh, breaks or while they were snacking or whatever. And uh, that she found that to be really difficult for her to handle. And so it, the conspiracy theory out there does not match up with the events that are understood from the trial against Chelsea Manning. And, uh, but um the media has done this thing where they basically have fed into the extradition and the political case against Julian Assange. I do a whole chapter in my book, Guilty of Journalism, about uh, uh, the three particular examples in which the New York Times, CNN, and then the Guardian newspaper and some other organizations are referenced by the court the courts in the United Kingdom that are trying to extradite him or that are allowing the extradition to the United States and show that these media organizations, they're not just fueling smears, they're printing stories that make it easier for prosecutors to argue that Julian Assange should be put on trial. And what are some of the smears? That's another thing I want, because I've, I've heard so many different things all of them insane. Yeah. What What are some of the smears that were thrown out there that are just patently false, especially when he well, was in the UK? Well, where to begin? I mean, <laughs> look, I, I'm not here to come on your show and say that people who accuse somebody else of sexual assault shouldn't be listened to. But primarily one of the biggest things, especially for people on the left that had made it difficult for the for, for, for supporting Julian Assange and also coming to his defense in this trial has been that there were two unnamed women from Sweden who had accused him of sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I would tell people who are concerned about that is, um, one, there's a very good book that came out from Verso uh, that Niels Meltzer wrote. He was a former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. And he did this deep dive investigation, forensically detailed. I don't do it in my book, but went deep into the way the Swedish prosecutors uh, basically violated the due process of Julian Assange, but also like didn't do right by these unnamed women who made these accusations. Uh, and the case was open and closed multiple times um, over the timeline. And they had opportunities to question Julian Assange and try to figure out if they wanted to bring actual charges against Julian Assange, uh, but they never did. They basically used the fact that he was claiming asylum in Ecuador's London embassy as this excuse to, you know, not close the case, to just keep it open. And also they said they couldn't go question him because he was in the embassy, even though they totally could have, you know, questioned him like, over Zoom or Skype or whatever. And it would have been, easy and they had a process for doing it you didn't have to be physically present to talk to him as, as i understand it um and then you know the other thing that people have heard about julian assange again i'll just speak to what a left audience might be most interested is this idea that like somehow he was a supporter of donald trump wanted to um see donald trump elected somehow participated he met with roger stone at one point well right? he didn't roger stone <laughs> oh, lied yeah, right? uh, who would have thunk it yeah i mean who <laughs> could have thought that the guy by the way you may not know this but roger stone was apparently involved in uh one of the the a part of these like dirty tricks campaign that that nixon had in the the 70s he was part of a group of people that was put up to go and um, attack Daniel Ellsberg while he was on the steps giving an anti-war speech. Um, and, you know, they, they were going to like break his kneecaps, uh, but were un 
able to actually get to him. And that, and, and we know that from, I'm not just making that up. We know that from a memo that was released a couple years ago. Uh, so Roger Stone, he basically was talking big about what he knew about WikiLeaks, like he had access and WikiLeaks kept telling him to stop because, you know, they, they were not, um, working. They were not collaborating with Roger Stone, but this became part of a narrative that WikiLeaks was working with Donald Trump and his campaign and other people who were associated. I mean, they did communicate with these individuals, uh, but I would say to you that this is where we have to understand that our two-party system is our own worst enemy, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, so to speak, because Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State when those documents were published by WikiLeaks. She has spoken about sending a drone to kill Julian Assange. Yikes. And... So when Donald Trump came on the scene and was talking, <laughs> that's like his number one thing that he's very good at doing when he was just babbling about all these campaign emails that were coming out from Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign and from the Democratic National Committee. And it was showing the corruption within their organizations. Um, Julian Assange made this choice or, or, or was inclined to believe that a Donald Trump presidency would be better than Hillary Clinton because Donald Trump wasn't talking about sending a drone to kill him. And so uh, he, he was wrong. It, it turned out to be that Donald Trump empowered the, we'll call them the, the swamp creatures that he thought he was going to drain. Uh, he put them in positions. He brought Jeff Sessions into. Oh, um, that, wasn't that beautiful? Attorney General. Um, you know, is, he, very, is he from Indiana? Just no, he's, he's, from he's, from, he's from Alabama. Alabama. I knew it was somewhere where they don't like it, black people. Where, where they have a KKK history. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, just, uh, and uh, and then Mike Pompeo, the the, the great Christian reconstructionist. Mm. Uh, I mean, his his ideas are pfft, whoa, like. Uh, and uh, he in, becomes in charge of the, the CIA, and uh, and just with those two individuals, I mean, it was over for Julian Assange at that point, and Donald Trump did nothing to stop Julian Assange. But I mean, just to close the the thought here that I was running with people believe that julian assange was a supporter of trump and republicans and and i think what we should recognize is it was more of like i'm not going to support hillary clinton look at what she was willing to do to wikileaks when she was in power i don't think i want four years of that that's not going to help me get out of this embassy and be free i'll take my chances with donald trump I can see that. I can see that. I, and as I, much as that's foolish, and as much as I, hey, I think you know, it, hindsight is twenty twenty. What? Right? Why do you, you think know, Tupac now? signed with Death Row? It wasn't because he was a fan of Shug Knight. You know, it was like you're gonna <laughs> get me out of prison. Remember, you know, Interscope Records was like, you know, we, hey guys, we got a platinum album. That guy's in prison. All right, all right, we have to pay for a tour. Okay. <laughs> you know, so true. The. One of the more complicated things I think it is for most people to wrap their heads around yeah, is to be a person like Assange or, as I've been talking about more and more on this show, kind of the feminists that were trying to get laws in place in the, in the late 60s, early 70s to protect women and kind of having to lean on right-wing politicians because they like, well, what about these kids? You know, the satanic panic kind of comes from that, right? And you understand why these people align themselves with these interests because it's going to help get your project done. Mm -hmm. And you can't see down the road what it's going to cause. There's no way in the world Julian Assange would know that it would kind of blow up in his face the way it did. Um, I get it. Is what I'm trying to say. I, I really get it. That's a desperate situation too. So I, you know, I hope people watching really, you know, 
think about that and understand that. It, it is well, it's another thing, just quickly, that like if you don't have the ideology, but you just have goals and objectives in mind, then you you would not necessarily think about partnering with certain people and how it is going to hamstring you. I think now you might a little bit more than 40, 50 years ago. Sure. Because everything, whatever you do now is with you for the rest of your life. So if you said something in the yearbook, Kevin, in <laughs> 2001, someone's going to be like, well, you had Kevin on your show? He said, you know, fuck Mrs. Johnson and <laughs> seen your last words. So that guy is a misogynist. <laughs> um, and I'm like, he was a giant, like, there is a lack of critical thinking when it comes to that. Is it a bit naive to believe that you can have a site like WikiLeaks and not expect pushback from the government? Ooh, uh, I like that question. Because I don't know that Julian Assange uh, implied in that is that WikiLeaks didn't anticipate this backlash from the U.S. empire. And I, I don't think they could have been prepared for it Uh although they should have recognized that what they were doing would incur some kind of wrath. And I think um, what they have done is uh, it, it was courageous, mm -hmm. but it has also become a kind of cautionary tale where I'm not sure people would be willing to try and repeat it, even though there is a value in having a kind of site that uh, performs this work. Uh, they wanted to be a stateless media organization. And by virtue of saying openly that that's what they wanted to do, they were not going to have an address in any particular country, which means they were not going to be beholden to any particular country's laws if they could get away with it. I think at one point they were close to maybe becoming like an Icelandic media organization, but they really held out this idea that, okay, we are not beholden to British laws or, okay, we are not going to follow European law or like, we're going to be this media organization that you cannot shut down mm -hmm. because the government will not have control over it. And in doing so, that was a frightening idea for the U S empire to see that a group was, um, didn't second guess or think twice about publishing documents they obtained, was able to receive these sensitive documents that could expose, you know, again, to use another phrase, like the emperor wears no clothes, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, and so it, why it became a target, that's why it became a target. Uh, and ultimately in 2017, WikiLeaks publishes all of these materials about the CIA's cyber warfare or hacking capabilities. And that's embarrassing to the CIA. That makes them upset. And then they do what they've done to so many people in history. And uh, you know, as I write about in my book, there were allegedly plans to kidnap or kill Julian Assange while he was in the embassy. Uh, do, and they were that furious. And, uh, you know, the things that they were coming up with doing are things that they have done to go after other figures, uh, anti-colonial figures like Patrice Lumumba and uh, Fidel Castro. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they were talking about poisoning Julian Assange. You know, they wanted to just give Lumumba poison toothpaste if they could. And uh, uh, so I think that if you are an organization and you wind up challenging U.S. power, you do have to be prepared for what is going to come. Do you think, and this is all speculation, I'm literally asking your opinion, do you think we can have another WikiLeaks, or do you think you, there is something... I, I I love the fact that you said you felt Assange and like Ed Snowden or or libertarian because every time I hear them talk I'm like oh he's the same with Glenn Greenwald you know, like oh sometimes these guys are super libertarian whatever it is what it is um do you think it's you can't have that moment again because there 
is something about fame. Um, there was a moment where everyone was behind, oh, what the Chris Smalls at Amazon. He was going to take on the giant. And they had that, you know, phone conversation leaked or meeting leaked where they called him dumb or whatever. And, you know, he's gathering more members and gathering more. And then one day he just became famous. And now there's like a whole mess <laughs> around, around that organizing effort. Can you have something as pure as this today without it being corrupted by the specter of fame? So there are all kinds of internal squabbles that took place at WikiLeaks. And as you're saying, that's not unique to organizations that take on struggles or uh, have goals or objectives to try and change the world or address some kind of social injustice. Uh, I, I think to me, what is more significant rather than uh, the fact that there was fame that was foisted upon Julian Assange, which by the way, uh, he kind of, I can't remember specifically where I read this, but it was a choice to have the world know him, but not have us be able to identify other members of WikiLeaks. It, it you know, made him the lightning rod. It made him the, the person that attracted all this attention. And it was to his benefit because he was able to claim the glory, but also he's the one that went to prison. Now he's the one that took the yeah. fall for everything that WikiLeaks did. All those other people are um they haven't been prosecuted some of them um they may claim they're living in hiding and that they're afraid that the government would prosecute them but they'll never be hounded and um tracked down the way that julian assange was perceived no one's gonna recognize them yeah 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 nobody will know who they are so they don't have that influential power um to to speak but i think the naivete of the uh this whole idea of, of setting up this leak site and uh, and just you know plunging headfirst into it and not really knowing where it was going to lead that that that's why it can't be reproduced because you know we now know what will happen so if so if I get off with you tonight uh, I will say goodbye thanks for mm -hmm. having me on the show mm -hmm. and I go start my own leak site I get a group of people who can help me do this i say i want to be the next julian assange i'm gonna know that i have now put myself out there and you know not only are the government is the u.s government going to be trying to identify all the sources and probably you know go after those people for leaking and put them on trial and send them to prison mm -hmm. but what i do you know it might mean that I don't know, PayPal won't let me process donations or uh, if I'm publishing sensitive national security information, it might mean that the FBI comes and knocks on my door. There are all these things that we can't claim ignorance anymore. We know from WikiLeaks that this is what the government is going to do to us. And um, it's, it's worse for independent journalists than it is for people who work for the prestige media organizations. You know, I don't have a, I don't have a general counsel or a lawyer that works for my media organization. I can't, you know, when an FBI agent comes, if they come to knock on our door, we can't just say, Hey, go talk to the attorney at the newspaper. He'll deal with the subpoena. Uh, if you, cause you want my, uh, I don't know, the notes, my reporters notes, yeah. or you want, access to my hard drives or whatever they're trying to get. Uh, so go talk to my attorney. He'll, he'll deal with that. Uh, I don't have resources and money to do it. So I'm extremely vulnerable to being attacked. And so I think that, you know, that, that naivete on the part of Assange, it made WikiLeaks possible. And then I think the moment, that I alluded to earlier where there was a lot of possibility for what technology could do. So there was this belief, uh, that I mean, when the last thing I'll say here is that when WikiLeaks first started, it looked like a Wikipedia page. It looked no <laughs> different than a Wikipedia page. There wasn't anything to it. It was this, this like, um, very crude site that you could go to that just had a bunch of text 
that said, um, you know, it was like a club had gotten together and put a bunch of different paragraphs up on somewhere and said, this is what we're going to do. And then people would go read it and say, all right, if you say so, I mean, I don't know if that's possible to do, but good luck with it. And then lo and behold, people actually were sending them information to share with everybody. Well, Kevin, we are coming up on the hour and I do want to thank you once again for taking the time to talk with us wherever you are watching or listening to the show. There are links in the description. First line is a link to Kevin's book, Guilty of Journalism. You see the poster behind him. Is there anything else um, you're, you're doing, Kevin, that we can plug here on the show before you go? Well, what I'll say is if anybody has a further interest in this, that my newsletter, which is available to anyone who subscribes, it's not like uh, it's a free newsletter, is uh, called The Dissenter. It's at thedissenter.org, T-H-E-D-I-S-S-E-N-T-E-R.org. Um, and it's where um, I do all of the work that I've been doing. I continue it uh, you know, building on the last 10 years of work. So like the drone whistleblower, Daniel Hale recently was released from prison. You know, we cover things of that nature. I talked to Terry Albury, who's a FBI whistleblower about uh, this no fly list lawsuit with the Supreme court. And so I continue to track all of these developments that are part of this story that's told in my book. Well, uh, make sure you you email that over to me so I can put it in the description for the audio only show that we'll goes do. out uh, next week or this week I forget. Uh, thank you guys for checking this out. If you want to join us uh, for the champagne room, I will be there. I think maybe Derek Varn is going to join me. I think MT will be there, but insanity will ensue. Uh, if you are listening to this show on Apple. Just subscribe and you can have access to the champagne room as well. Again, the book is called Guilty of Journalism. His name is Kevin Gastola. Thank you for hanging out with me, Kevin. I told you the interview will be painless and fun. Have a very good night. Stay warm in the Windy City. And I appreciate you. Thank you, Jason. Good night. That was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. And you know what else I really like, Kevin? He's going to be really easy to cut clips for. So I'll be going to the champagne room. MT sent me all these videos that she wants you guys to see. So I hope she's there. People were messaging me. I was talking to Varn before I went on air. So hopefully Varn joins me in the champagne room. This should be fun. We can talk about this live thing we're about to do. Now, now that the flyer's here, it feels real. So I'm excited. So on that note, guys, thank you for joining me. I'll be seeing hopefully a lot of you guys tomorrow as we'll be doing another Red Zone tomorrow. We're going to talk about the biggest sport in sports. The biggest sport, the biggest sport, the biggest story in sports. I think it's the biggest story in sports. Women's college basketball is the biggest news right now. And there was something I said a long time ago. I was like, you know, if you know when women's sports is taken off when dudes are wearing jerseys of female athletes. It's already happened. Caitlin Clark, she might be the biggest star right now in all of sports. So it should be a fun discussion. We'll talk a little Major League Baseball. We'll definitely talk a little bit of shit. So I'll see you guys tomorrow night. And on that note, oh, yeah. And everybody, send a big belated birthday shout out to the Quintern. How can I forget that? The Quintern. Turn 25. He made this flyer. Don't forget. June 8th if you're in the D.C. area and if you're not it doesn't matter because it'll be online as well thank you guys and let's watch Quinn's exit video for us we are out